Counting. I know I wanted to start off with just kind of talking a little bit about um, the presentation tonight and why we have looked at bringing in our speaker tonight. So just a few things. Mindfulness is a simple practical tool to work directly on calming the nervous system. It helps to regulate emotions and refocus attention. The Portage County Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Coalition and Portage County Health and Human Services, CCS and CSP advisory committees have noticed a significant increase in teens struggling with stress and depression. Learning and implementing meditation tools will help to reduce the stress reactions felt by us all, including children and teens in our community. And this is why we felt that this would be a good topic and bring in our speaker that we have tonight. So our speaker tonight is Chad McGee, correct? Who is a meditation teacher who creates, teaches, and researches the impacts of meditation practices on well-being and performance. Chad's work has been featured on media outlets such as ESPN and NPR. His work has also been published in scientific journals. Chad has taught meditation in various sites, including with first responders, current college athletes, retired professional athletes, and K-12 students and teachers. Chad's teaching approach incorporates findings from modern neuroscience along with accessible practices to incorporate meditation training into daily life. At the University of Wisconsin Athletic Department, Chad became the first ever director of meditation training in major college sports. Chad is an honorary affiliate of the Center for Healthy Minds at UW-Madison. He is a member of Under Armour's International Human Performance Council and offers trainings through Inner Edge Meditation. So it is with my pleasure that we have Chad Kibihi here tonight. So thank you, Michelle, for the wonderful introduction uh, and to the Mental Health Coalition for the opportunity to join you tonight. It is, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to be here tonight. And as Michelle mentioned, uh, I'm a meditation teacher. And sometimes when I say that, I wonder what goes through people's minds. So I'll ask them at times and they'll say like, well, aren't you supposed to be wearing robes or tie dye or ponytail? Like, what's going on here, man? But obviously that's not who I am. That's not how I roll. That's not how I understand meditation training. When I think about meditation training, I'm thinking about this. We're training the mind for performance and well-being. We're taking advantage of some of the hardwired neural circuitry in our minds to put it to use, to put us in the direction of what it is that we're trying to accomplish, to be healthy, happy people and go after our goals. So if I do my job tonight, there'll be certain outcomes that you'll feel very comfortable that we cover. You'll have a good sense of what is meditation. You'll have a, a clear sense of how it might be valuable to you, how it might be valuable to those around you, for your performance and for your well-being. And when I say performance here, I'm not just talking about athletic performance. Performance can be uh, academically, in the community, professionally. Anywhere where we show up, we have an element of we're performing. We're bringing who we are to that environment. And of course, well-being and performance are deeply intertwined, not mutually exclusive. And also, you'll have a sense of what are some of the practical tools and skills that you can use to put this training to life. So before I continue on into that, I wanted to share a little bit about who I am and some of my story and what got me to be able to join you all in this capacity in the front of the room. So I'm from small town Illinois, Sycamore, Illinois, born and raised, proud son of Mike and Gail McGee. Uh, and then at 17 years old, a lot of suffering showed up in my life. And I had a choice. I could either run from that suffering, I could hide from that suffering, or I could meet it. I could face it directly. I could somehow figure out a way to go through it. And something in me compelled me to go through it. And I didn't know how to do that. So that put me on a path to try to figure out how do I handle this. And it wasn't until I found mindfulness and meditation that I felt like I had the skills to be able to not only have the frameworks of dealing with that suffering, but the moment-to-moment -moment abilities to handle it. And then long after that suffering changed, these practices continued to be a huge support for me as Chad, as a guy living his life. And then my first career was as a public school teacher. And I felt like I was sitting on something so valuable. I felt like these practices could be so helpful for the kids that I was spending so much time with, for the colleagues that I was teaching with. So I started to share a little bit with them to see if it might be helpful. And they found these practices useful. They felt more stable, more grounded, more able to connect with each other. So then I got really curious, well, I wonder if there's more ways to share these practices with more people. So I joined a group on campus at UW-Madison, Center for Healthy Minds. I'll say more about them in a moment. 
But there I was able to train with a huge range of populations, including law enforcement officers, local level law enforcement, state level law enforcement, and federal law enforcement. And I'm still very fortunate, every eight weeks or so, I'm able to go to a different spot in the country to train with FBI SWAT teams. And the very same training that we're here talking about tonight, how we're using meditation to train for performance and well-being. Spend time with corporate groups, healthcare groups, and athletes. So about six or seven years ago, I uh, met a guy named Chris Portland. Chris played football in Wisconsin and then played in the NFL. After he retired from the NFL, he wanted to do something to benefit guys who played in the league. So long story short, we created an eight-week training, eight-week mindfulness training for 17 retired NFL players. And we didn't know what would happen. Would these guys think this is a bunch of hippy-dippy, woo-woo, don't tell me about meditation, I played in the league for a decade? But that's not what we found. What we found is they found it rigorous and beneficial. It supported them, not only as men, as humans, living a happy, healthy life, but also in their pursuits now that they were done with their playing careers, professionally, whatever it is that they were doing. And one of those graduates, uh, or one of those people that was in that training, is a SPASH graduate. And I didn't even realize it was a SPASH graduate until this morning, Ross Kalaji. So Ross was in this training, and Ross was one of the people who was uh, staff at UW Athletics. And a couple of them said, hey, would you ever want to come and do stuff with some of our teams? So Ross invited me into the, the football team, into the weight room, and we started to do some training there. And that work continued to expand to more and more teams, and basketball, volleyball, softball. Now it's a wide range of teams in the athletics department that are participating. That ultimately led to the position I have at UW-Madison as the director of meditation training. So this is the first of its kind position in the nation, uh, and I think it's beyond my own personal interest. I think it's really exciting for us. When I say us, I mean us in Wisconsin, because I believe in the Wisconsin idea of bringing the insights from the university out to all of us that live in the state, so all of us can think through how can we use meditation to train our minds for greater performance and greater well-being. Because I think we're all looking for that inner edge. We all have an inner life. We all have thoughts. We all have emotions. The question is, do we have the skills to work with those thoughts and emotions? And when we develop the skills to not let those things run over us or dictate what's happening all the time to us, then we develop the capacity to have that inner edge, to be able to work with things as they're happening, and then we can go and progress more steadily in the direction of our goals, our performance and our well-being goals. So I mentioned a little bit uh, that I was based for six years at this group, the Center for Healthy Minds. It's a research group at UW-Madison it was founded by the guy on the right, his name is Richie Davidson. And Rich is a neuroscientist. And after getting his PhD from Harvard, came to Wisconsin, uh, was faculty in psychology, and he wanted to study meditation. But him and his colleagues, his advisors said, don't do that. Meditation is not the stuff of serious scientific study. You will tank your scientific career if you do this. And fortunately, he did not listen. And he single-handedly went on to create what, a whole new scientific field that we now refer to as contemplative neuroscience, or the science of training in the mind. So now the center has 14 PhD-level scientists all working around the central question of what constitutes a healthy mind. And maybe more importantly, how can we train for those qualities of mind? So it's from these two streams, the stream of kind of some of my personal experience, but a lot of it from the folks that I've been able to train with, some of these elite corners of performance, whether it's athletes, SWAT teams, corporate groups. And the other stream is rigorous science. What do we know scientifically about training the mind? And tonight what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring those two streams together so that you can identify yourself. What are the small hinges for you that can swing big doors to your performance in well -being? So there's a couple key foundational things that we know. Scientifically, we know that humans have what we refer to as neuroplasticity. And this may be familiar to some of you. Neuroplasticity is this simple scientific truth that your brain was built to learn. That's what it does. It's a learning machine. It is constantly happening. The question is, who's in charge of that process? Who's in charge of the qualities of mind that are happening for you? Is it kind of left to the whirling, swims of, uh, swirling winds of circumstance? Or are you taking responsibility to train for certain qualities? So in meditation training, we put ourselves back in the driver's seat to train for certain qualities. And the way that I think about it is strength and conditioning for the mind. So I'm not assuming anything is wrong with you. I'm not trying to fix anything. What I'm doing is meeting you where you're at and moving you forward. Taking you from good to great, 
great to elite, and whatever it is, community member, parent, professionally, whatever it is that fires you up, giving you the skills to be able to move in that direction more confidently. So I want to share briefly a, a video with you with someone who I've had the good fortune of training with, Jonathan Taylor. And, and everyone refers to him as JT. JT played for Wisconsin. He's now in the NFL. And a few years ago, he was in the same seat you were in, kind of being exposed, curious about what this mindfulness and meditation stuff is and how it could be a support. So in this video, he kind of talks through some of his experiences with that uh, and some yoga practice, which is, we won't be doing yoga tonight, don't worry, but it's a complementary practice that we weave into the training as well. So one of these days I'll get my acts together and after showing that video I'll be wearing the same shirt that I'm wearing in the video. I just think it'd be really funny. People will be thinking like, yeah, this dude really has like two shirts. <laughs> Come on, man, let's like, get another shirt. So JT, uh, also I, I, did, I dished the sport code. I felt like we got to know each other a little bit, a little less from I hope that's, that's okay. So, uh, so JT clearly is, is an elite performer athletically. And he has certain passions and interests that he's going after, that he's willing to put in the time and effort to do those little things, to find the talent to back up the talent, as we say. But I wonder for you, each of you, what's your passion? What are the things that fire you up? What is it that motivates you? If you had you know, time and space and resources, like how would you want to spend your time? And for some of you, that's going to be related to your professional pursuits. Maybe it's family pursuits. Maybe it's things in the community. But when you think, how can meditation be added to the mix to be a support for you to continue to stabilize that, to go after that? 
to give you the skills to work with what's happening in your mind and body so that you can more confidently go in the direction of your dreams. Uh, another thing that I just wanted to point out really quickly here, I mentioned uh, earlier Ross Kalaji, who wouldn't be here without Ross and all of his efforts, but another player who's the back of the head you saw very briefly in the video was Garrett Groshek, uh, Amherst grad, and, and Grosh, uh, great guy, some of you may know him, uh, met him when we got this work underway, and he's another reason that I'm able to join you today, because Grosh found a way to continue to help this navigate in the Wisconsin football program. And Grosh and I still have contact today, so I was super excited to text him earlier and say, hey man, that's Fash, uh, and he, he sent out the word. So if any of Grosh's fam or friends are here, like I would love to meet you because he's a great guy. So when I think about the work we talked about this briefly, it's, it's strength conditioning for the mind. And traditional strength conditioning is this. It's some version of bigger, faster, stronger. And every weight room everywhere has this plaster, right? On the plates or on the wall or something like that. So when I think about meditation training and strength conditioning for the mind, it's training the mind to be more focused, more resilient, and a better teammate. And we're taking advantage of neuroplasticity to train for it. And we're not just talking about it. We're not just hoping for it. We're actually spending the time to train the mind for these qualities. So we're going to take a little bit now to dig into each one of these. Beginning with more focused. So the, this idea of the eye of the hurricane comes from George Bumper. George is the meditation teacher who Phil Jackson brought in to train with his teams in the 90s. And of course, the eye of the hurricane has a sense of stability, a sense of balance, a sense of okayness, while the storm rages all around. That eye of the hurricane, that's mindfulness. It's just called by a different name. And all of us have experienced that. We've had those moments when we had that sense of stability, groundedness, and balance while things were going haywire all around us. But for many of us, that was random. It's great when it's there, it's a bummer when it's not. What we're doing is we're training to experience that more often. And one of the foundational skills we have to do if we want to experience that eye of the hurricane is train our attention. So, how many times has somebody told you, maybe it's been a while, uh, maybe more when you were a kid, or have you told somebody else to pay attention? Anyone ever told you that? You ever told that to somebody? Hundreds of times. I was with the students today at SPASH and I asked them the same question, and you know, hundreds, thousands of times, right? You just feel like you hear it all the time. And how many times has, have we been taught how to pay attention? Almost never, for most of us. We just like expect it to be there like magic. But it's not, it's a skill. Just like any physical skill, this is a mental skill. There was an amazing study that was done a few years ago at Harvard where they sent people text messages. And the first text message was, what are you doing? And the second text message was, what are you paying attention to? So let's just, we'll get some voices to shout out and we don't need to do the mic, I can just like repeat it back out. What percentage of time do you think most people are paying attention to what they're doing? 10%? 25. 25. Yeah, 25 feels about right. Some of you may be thinking, like, well, for me, maybe I'm a little, you know, lower than that. Who knows? So what they found, this has been replicated many times across a lot of populations, is 47% of the time people are paying attention to what they're doing. So for some of you, you might be like, ah, that's pretty good, right? You know, like, I'd be happy with that, right? Uh, but think about the implications of that. You've all, I'm sure, had that experience where you're reading something and you get to the end of the page and you have no idea what you read. Yeah, I don't know what that feels like. So that's attention. That's not knowing where your attention is and it's wandered off. Or I'd like to think that what I'm talking about tonight is so compelling that you have stuck with me every second of the way. And that has not happened. Each of you has wandered out of the room, thought about something from earlier today or something maybe coming up later. It's totally normal. Mind wandering happens, it's not a problem. The biggest myth and misconception about all of mindfulness and meditation is that somehow you're supposed to empty your mind or blank your mind. You can't do it, it's impossible to do. The mind produces thoughts like the lungs breathe. What we're doing is we're shifting our relationship to those thoughts so that we don't get pulled off into that storm that we can train attention to stay in that eye of the hurricane. But again, we can't just talk about it, we have to actually train for it. So we do a lot of practices to do that. So I want to share with you a couple of practices 
that are really popular across all the environments that I train in. And so the first practice uh, is called the 456 practice. And you're going to see why it's called that very simple. Pretty simple way. So the way it works, and I invite you to join me, is you breathe in for four, you hold for five, you blow out for six. Let's do that again. In for four, hold for five, out for six. Just kind of notice how things are for you. So I've done a couple, four, five, six breaths. So let's actually, I'd love to hear from a couple of you, so uh, Mike would be helpful here. Just what did you notice doing this couple, four, five, six breaths? Kind of what happened for you in your mind and in your body? What did you notice? What we'll grabbed your attention? You focused on your breathing. I can just repeat it back out. Yes, Mike. So you focused on your breathing, yeah? And what did you notice in your mind and body as a result of focusing on your breathing? Kind of calm things down. Anyone else feel that? Kind of like felt like calm things down a little bit, a little more relaxed. And you'll notice in the instructions for the four, five, six breath, I didn't say calm down. I didn't say relax. In fact, I think when we tell ourselves to calm down or relax, if you're anything like me, the opposite happens. Right? I get like more worked up. It just doesn't work. Right? It's like telling yourself at the end of the night, like, just fall asleep. It just gets you tense, and you don't fall asleep. But by paying attention to the breath in this way, that sense of calm, that sense of relax naturally happens. Scientifically, we're shifting from sympathetic to parasympathetic nervous system. We're just harnessing the body's natural ability to do that. So I invite you to think, when might a practice like the four, five, six breath be useful in your life? Like, do you ever have a moment when you're experiencing a strong emotion? Ever get frustrated professionally in a relationship with the world? I would imagine you're a human. That's going to happen. And when you start to boil over, do, do you act skillfully in the world? Of course not. Right? So we can notice, oh, but I'm experiencing this strong emotion. Do a practice like that, kind of regulate, you know, kind of get those emotions in check, or concentrate the mind. So JT, who we were talking about before, started to incorporate this into his lifts, because he wanted to be fully present for that lift, right? Fully present for that moment. And so now lots of athletes do it, whether it's you know, athletically, on the field of competition or in training, or academically, right? Before they head into class, kind of concentrate their mind before they go. Think about as adults, before we head into a difficult meeting, a conversation we need to have with somebody. We can kind of calm the system down, concentrate the mind, and bring that into our next interaction. Another practice that I love, it's deeply transportable. Uh, the language I learned from Coach Tom Coughlin, former NFL head coach, front office guy, uh, and he talks about be where your feet are. And of course, that means you're having your mind and body in the same place, right? But we actually train for it. And the way we train for it is really simple. Right now, I invite you to feel the sensations that are happening in your feet. Feel the pressure your feet are making on the floor. And in contact with shoes or socks. Tingling. It doesn't matter what the sensations are. When you let go of any effort you're making. So you just did a practice to get your mind and body in the same place. The only time you can experience a sensation is in the present moment. Snaps you out of the future, snaps you out of the past, and gets you right here. So if anyone's watching, uh, I assume there's some Badger sport fans in the, in the room and online, you wouldn't know this, but a lot of Badger athletes are doing this, whether it's at the free throw line, right? For kickoff, wherever it may be, before the game, in the locker room. They're doing a practice like this to be where their feet are, right? Can you accomplish anything that's already happened in the past? Can, you, can we go back and change it? Of course not, right? Can we fast forward into the future to make things happen? Of course not. The only way we can influence things is to take advantage of the moment in front of us, to be where our feet are and go after that moment. And all of this allows us to see clearly so that we're not caught up with all the add-ons that the mind is creating. We actually see the world in front of us for the way that it is. We actually see what's happening in our own minds and bodies the way that it is. So I want to do one more quick practice that can support us in this, and it's called visual anchoring. So right now, I bet you just kind of look around. And if you're at home, too, just kind of look around wherever you're at. 
And then pick a spot. Just pick some small detail to pay attention to. And let your eyes steady on that small detail. If there's tension in your shoulders, see if you can let it loosen. Or your jaw. If your mind wanders away from that visual anchor, no problem. You just bring it back. All right, you can let go of any effort there. And notice how things are for you now. There's a sense of that calm, a sense of relaxed. How many of you in the practices we just did, we just did a couple of these practices, how many of your minds wandered? Most of us, right? Our mind wandered off to something else. It's not a problem. So the way I think about this, especially in the strength conditioning model, is every time your mind wanders off and you notice it and you bring it back, that's like a rep for your attention. You just got stronger with your attention. And we know from the science that you're actually rewiring your brain. Neurons that fire together, wire together. So you can't be bad at meditation. It breaks my heart when I talk to somebody and they you know, find out I'm, I'm interested in this mindfulness meditation stuff. And they're like, yeah, I tried it. But I'm just bad at it. I can't do it. It's just like, oh, no. Because you can't be bad at it. It's impossible. Even if you sit down for two minutes to practice, and it's just kind of ping pong balls up there, just all over the place, right? It's not a problem. You're giving it space, and you're developing the muscles to be able to work with that. It's not a problem. So we've been kind of doing this together, but it's always important as we're doing these practices to reflect, figure out what's going on, what's true for us. Reflecting on what did we notice, and also when we might be able to apply these practices in our life. So again, I ask you to just shout out like an idea or two, and I can repeat it back on the mic. Of when could you drop in, whether it's four, five, six, be where your feet are, or visual anchor. Think about your life, personally, professionally. When do you think you could implement one of these practices? Before you get out of the car to go to work. Love it. Before getting out of the car to go to work. Right? Drive to work. A lot has already happened, right? Like we've got a six year old at home. A lot has already happened at home before you get to work, right? And then you get to work, and the mind kind of has some stuff with home, has some stuff with work. Just a quick reset. All right, and then hey, great idea. What's another idea you have where you could drop it in? After work. <laughs> after work. Before work and after work, right? Leave a little bit of what happened at work at work, okay? So the one of the things that I encourage all of you to think about is, and both of these uh, suggestions point to this, is the transitions in your day. When you're going from one thing to something else, are really great times to drop these practices in. So even if it's you know professionally, if your work includes you know going from one meeting to another meeting, great. There's an opportunity to do a practice, right? If you're teaching, right, there's one period to the next period. Whatever it may be, kind of find those small transitions. A lot of folks like to uh, involve these into their daily routines. So every morning you wake up uh, and brush your teeth, right? You can just add this right into the mix. When you're brushing your teeth, just take a second, be where your feet are, and then move forward. Another idea may be uh, in relationships. You ever have a, a time where you're talking to a friend and you just realize that you have not been listening at all to what they're saying. Okay? Doesn't feel good, okay? So we can do a quick practice like this. Like nobody knows if you're standing there feeling your feet so you can be a little more grounded and open for the conversation that you're having. Or how about stress? Anyone ever in here ever get stressed out? Heck <laughs> yeah, we do. Because you're a human, right? And it happens to all of us. And we know there's certain things that are gonna stress us out. Maybe it's a difficult conversation we need to have with somebody, right? Or there's some reoccurring thing that's happening in our life. And when that happens, and we know it's going to happen, we can do this before, when we find ourselves in the midst of it, we have access. These become like a tool belt of practices that we can use whenever we want to use them. All right, so that was more focused. Now I want to dig into the second area, which is more resilient. And the way I want to do that is I want to share some research that we recently published with law enforcement officers. And the reason I chose this research to share is two reasons. One, I wanted to show how this sort of training can be used across a huge range of populations, from high school students earlier today to law enforcement officers to whatever our personal or professional paths are. 
And it shows kind of the, some of the things that make us human aren't necessarily tied to any you know, profession or, or personal characteristics that we may have. So what did we find after officers were engaged in this training for a while? We found they had reduced perceived stress. So this is perceived stress. The stress in their world didn't go away. And if some of you are in law enforcement or know folks in law enforcement, that's a very stressful profession, right? as are many other professions. So the stress didn't change, but how they perceived it changed. And as a result of that, their body and their minds experienced less stress. We also found reduction in anxiety and depression symptoms. So as humans, we're going to experience all sorts of emotions. We're going to experience what we may think of as, as positively balanced emotions, like you know, happy, joyful, excited. We'll also experience challenging emotions, sadness, worry, overwhelm. It's totally normal. We're humans. That's what happens. But when we develop the skills to work with those emotions, then we give ourselves a chance to not let them run the show, right? We have the skills to be able to work with them. And improve sleep quality. Anyone in here ever have issues falling asleep? Staying asleep? Most of us, right? Dysregulated sleep is really common in our culture. In law enforcement, it's through the roof. You know, and in other high-stress professions like education and healthcare, we see all sorts of disruptions in people's sleep. And by using these practices, we can help get sleep in line. So even the practices we did a little bit earlier, could you see yourself doing that before bed? Lots of folks use these practices as part of their kind of sleep routine, or even while they're laying there in bed, just kind of do some of these practices, help kind of calm the system down. And once sleep gets in line, all sorts of other performance indicators start to get better. And the last thing that we find, uh, and I wanted to share this in case you're aware of folks who you know, are experiencing this, is we saw a reduction in PTSD symptoms. And so the work I'm doing isn't clinical, it isn't mental health provided, and it should never be uh, done in replacement of that for folks that need those services. But this can also help with some of these really deleterious effects like PTSD, and some of the symptom reduction. So of these things here, the perceived stress, anxiety, depression, and sleep quality, one of the central themes that's across all of those is the ability to work with thoughts. And for most of us, we were never taught how to work with thoughts in our own mind. In fact, we were taught in some ways the exact opposite. This is going to make me sound fancier than I am, right? But I think it was Descartes who said, I think, therefore I am. Was it Descartes? Anybody know? I should have just said it was Descartes. It would have been like, man, this guy's got his act together. But uh, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I think that's like a misunderstanding of the human mind. Thoughts happen. Thoughts get experienced. Some of them we want to just let go on by. Some of them we take really personally, but some of them aren't personal. We have to have the ability to work with thoughts as they're happening. And when we develop that ability, we put ourselves back in the driver's seat. We're no longer getting hooked by every thought that comes by. We can choose which ones are helpful, which ones are skillful, and which ones aren't. And in order to illuminate this, I'm going to share a quick video of a thought parade. And in this uh, video, the example that I use is directed toward high school students, but I think all of you will probably translate it in a way that makes sense for your life. Start and feel my feet on the floor, my breath kind of 
settling into my chest. I wonder how I did on that test earlier today. You know, my shoulders tighten a little bit. Kind of relax. Lunch was delicious today. similar or what was different? Yep, the first one refocused myself, absolutely. So did you notice that the thought was the same in both of them? The first thought was the same in both of them? How did I do on that test today? So that's a normal thought, right, for a high school kid to have, right? The human version for an adult might be like, that meeting didn't go the way I wanted it to go. That conversation with my wife didn't go the way I wanted it to go. My son, whoever, right? And then we relive it. But in the first one, after the thought came up, what did I choose to do with my attention? With your body. Brought it back to something that was happening in the present moment, whether it's sensation of breathing, shoulders, feet on the floor. Remember, the only time you can experience a sensation is in the present moment. So it snaps us out of thinking and gets us back into the body. Whereas that second one, that first thought came up, I wonder how I did on that test today, or whatever the example may be, uh, that conversation with my wife didn't go the way I wanted it to go, and then what did I do with my attention next? Yeah, it stayed with the next thought, and then the next thought, and the next thought, and the next thought, and it started to spiral, right? And it didn't spiral to a place where the end of it I was like, and I'm awesome, and it's going to turn out great. Because if your mind is anything like my mind, my mind, that's not how they tend to work. They tend to spiral and go to a place that's challenging, right? that's difficult. It's not a problem to have these thought parades. They're totally normal. The skill is in noticing them when they're happening and saying, is this a thought parade that I want to go down? Because some thoughts are really useful, right? Like you got bills to pay. You got a job to show up to. You got to get things done. But some thoughts aren't. Right? Some thoughts we get swept up in and we want to have the space to let them go. And when we do that, we can show up to the world in a different way. John Kevin Zinn uh, is a, a scientist, meditation teacher. He created mindfulness-based stress reduction. And he talks about, in some ways, we've almost become a different species. We've turned into human doings. And we've lost our birthright as human beings. We are unbelievably good at getting stuff done. Like, we build buildings. We send people to Mars. We haven't sent people to Mars yet. We will send people to Mars. We do unbelievable things with our ability to do. But at some point, we kind of lose that ability to just be present with what's happening in our own life. And each of us stumble across it in different ways. For some of us, maybe it's you know hunting or fishing or being in nature or certain activities. Lots of folks, you know, with sport, talk about that ability to be present or... You know, when it's like, you know, go to the lake house up north. When I finally get up there, then I'll feel a certain way. But we're shifting from not needing the external world to be a certain way to have these qualities. We want to be able to have these qualities in our own minds and train for them so that it can happen on Wednesday night, right? 
So we can have them on Tuesday morning. We train for them so that they're there. Or how about sleep? Uh, have you ever had a thought parade when you're trying to lay down to sleep? Where you're just laying there and it just, the rodeo begins, right? And it is just crazy town, right? Spinning out of control. And of course, that's just the mind getting lost in a thought parade. When we notice it and say, oh, it's no big deal, it's no problem. We don't need to beat ourselves up about it. It's just a thought parade. And then can choose to bring our attention back to the body. The body's tired. It's the end of the day. We steady attention there, and then the body can fall asleep. Or with technology. I think this is really important. We talked about it today with the high school kids, but I think for us too, whether it's social media or the news, whatever it may be, the media that we consume, it's so easy to start to spiral and lose touch with what's actually happening. And we want to be informed. We want to know what's going on. It's great to be able to connect with people on social media or read about the news, but we can notice that tendency when it goes from useful and skillful to kind of spiraling out of control. No problem. We just notice it and come back. So that was more resilient. So we've talked about how to train the mind to be more focused. We've talked about how to train the mind to be more resilient. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how to train the mind to be a better teammate. And when I say teammate, I'm not just talking about sport teammate. Yes, that could be it. But a teammate is any relationship that you have, whether it's with colleagues, with friends, with family, and also with yourself. For many of us, the harshest relationship we have is with only number one. So if we can figure out a way to ease that relationship, it can help a whole lot of things. So I want to share a little bit of science with you that when I first came across it was kind of astounding. And the science is this, that one's satisfaction with their own relationships is as good a predictor of their mortality as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. So I'm gonna say that again a little bit differently. We know scientifically that your satisfaction with your relationships tells us just as much or predicts just as well how long you will live as if you choose to smoke a pack of cigarettes a day. Isn't that wild? That blows me away that that is true. And think about the public health campaigns that we've had around smoking. We all know the impacts of making the choice to smoke, yet most of us don't realize the impacts of training to have better relationships. And we know that we can train the mind for better relationships. We have this capacity of neuroplasticity. We can train for certain qualities of mind that support our relationships to be better, to be more satisfying. And we have to do it because we as humans have what scientifically we, we refer to as the negativity bias, which may be familiar to some of you. It's this hardwired evolutionary trait that we have as humans to constantly be scanning for the negative, to constantly be looking for the negative, for the challenge in the world. And this was really useful back in the day when we needed to know, is that rustling in the bushes a lion, or is it just the breeze coming through? Because if we get that wrong, it's over. So we're always scanning for that threat. But if we don't check it, then our mind is going to always be looking for the negative, and what the mind ponders frequently becomes habit of mind. So if our mind's always looking for the negative, what are we going to end up believing about the world? It's all negative. We should just expect that cynicism and fear become the baseline from which we operate. And we see that happen all of the time. I think what we need to do is train the mind to notice the good. Because will there always be challenge in the world? Yes. Always. It's going to happen. Will there also always be good things that are happening in the world? Yes. Absolutely. Always going to happen. But if we don't train to notice those good things, then we'll miss them. We'll step right over them. We have to actually train for it. And we're not training for it in this like toxic positivity, denying the difficulty, you know, Hallmark style, just notice the good, it's actually allowing us to see the world more clearly as it is. And one of the things, honestly, that has kind of surprised me the most in the past three or four years of spending time in these elite environments, whether it's, you know, with the SWAT guys or with the men and women at UW Athletics, is how much time we spend training and appreciation. Because these men and women want to be at their absolute best. Right? Like they are striving at every level, as each of you are, going in the direction of what you want to pursue. But in order to do that, we need to build ourselves up from a place of strengths. 
what it is that we're doing well, and how can we continue those things. So that when those obstacles come, we're not beaten down by them, we can find our way through them. But if we don't train for that ability to notice the good, then all we're going to see is negative and challenge and not be able to meet those moments. So there's a lot of ways to train for this. And one that I really enjoy, it's super simple, and lots of folks use it, is it's called One Good Thing. So right now, I invite each of you to reflect what's one good thing that's happened in the past, just today, let's just do today. Just what comes to mind? What's some, what's some of the good stuff that happened today? Let the thoughts come up, maybe images come up. And as those thoughts and images are coming up, make sure you track what it feels like in your body. Notice it in your chest, shoulders, stomach, legs. Can you let go of any effort to remember some of these good things? So this is a really important skill. And part of what we did right there was not only the thinking around it, but it's tracking the felt sense of it in your body. One of the ways that I like to think about it is an idea is only a rumor until it's known in the body. If you just tell yourself, you ever find yourself like, I'm going I'm to just be more grateful. That's it. I'm going to be more grateful. And watch out because I'm doing it. And then it just fades, and all of a sudden you're no longer doing it. When we train the mind, we have to train the mind to be in connection with the body. Because when we don't do that, it's not stable. But when we train the mind to be in connection with the body, then it has a sense of stability. Because every moment of your life, you know where you're always going to be? With your body. It's there. So when we train the mind to be, have a healthy relationship there, then it becomes a stable source for the qualities we're interested in. All right. So we're coming to uh, kind of the, the end of our time together tonight. So did I do my job? Is your understanding of what meditation is a little bit different than it was 45 minutes ago? How it might be valuable to you, both in your well-being and your performance, and some ideas on how to train? So we talked about meditation as strength conditioning for the mind. And we dove into three important qualities, including training to be more focused, more resilient, and a better teammate. So hopefully you have some ideas, some frameworks, some practices on all of these to help move this forward. And hopefully some ideas on when it might show up for you, show up for those that you care about, whether it's around stressful things in your life, whether it's around sleep or performance. And of course, performance here isn't just limited to athletics. It's however we show up in the world as community members, professionally, in our family relationships, whatever that may be, and some simple practices. Right? It's really easy to just pause from time to time, be where you're feeling. It's really easy to get curious about what's going on in your mind and notice, oh, I think I'm just lost in a thought parade here, and then choose to step out of that thought parade. And really good to start to notice all the positive things that are happening in the world. Like right now, like I'm very aware of how fortunate I am to not only have the opportunity to have encountered these practices and benefit from them, but to be able to connect with other people who are interested. Like this is dream come true stuff for me. So I want to be present for this. I really want to enjoy this. And all of you have those opportunities. These good things are happening all the time. But are we present for them? Are we able to savor them as they come up? So moving forward, uh, resources. I'll be sharing with, with Michelle and the committee some resources that you all can have access to if you want to continue to explore. It can be really wise to form some community around this. So some of you may already have that, whether it's connecting with somebody who's here tonight uh, or online, there's a lot of amazing resources that are available to form community around these practices. I really want to encourage you to choose one thing. Meditation training is not in the business of full life makeovers. It's in the business of finding small things that we add up over time in fractional advantages. So choose one thing as a result of choosing to be here tonight. Maybe it's an idea you want to research read more about. Maybe it's a practice you want to implement into your life. Maybe something came up where you're like, you know, I should call so-and-so and talk about this. Whatever it is, just pick one thing and do it as a result of your time, our time together tonight. And you got to make it your own. There's no one-size-fits-all. There's no like way to be a perfect meditator. There's no uh, absolute best way to implement this. And this may be my favorite picture that's ever existed. This is my nephew Magnus, who's doing like this Spider-Man, Easter Bunny, it's kind of dark, but he's got like, you know, an elephant nose sort of thing, right? And think about like the freedom of kids to just like make it the way they want it to be. And as adults, sometimes we get a little constricted, 
But we have to figure out a way to bring this into our life with a sense of openness and a sense of creativity. You can't get it wrong. What you can do is implement it, see what happens, and continue to adjust to make it fit into your life. So I want to thank you. Thank you, Michelle, again. Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to come and join. Uh, and I also want to thank some of the people who I've known in my life uh, that have impacted me in positive ways, some of whom I was able to write their names up here. And it's because of these people and their wisdom and their care that I've been able to benefit from so much and move in the direction of the dreams that I so deeply care about. So I encourage you, if somebody gave you the stage, gave you the clicker for 45 minutes to talk about what fires you up, what motivates you, what you think could benefit other people, who would you put on your slide? Who are the people that you are a better human because you knew those people? And not only think about who those people are, but again, feel it in your body right now. You have a cavalry of supporters that want the absolute best for you. And when you can bring those people to mind and feel that support, it brings a sense of strength, it brings a sense of stability. So thanks again. Amazing time to be with you all. I'm happy to take questions. We can do it formally on the stage uh, with, with the mic, or I'm happy to just kind of hang out and chat afterwards. So thanks, everybody. Any questions? Can All right, so short, short survey as you, as you walk out the door. You can fill that out, that'd be really helpful, thanks. Any comments or questions for the whole group? Yeah? Sorry. When you met the students at the school, they did a couple of exercise ideas, was it a similar kind of thing? Yes. Okay. Yep, yep, so if you have kids of your own or others, like, yeah, one of the things I wanted to do was keep it pretty consistent to allow those sorts of conversations to happen. To say, like, oh, hey, you know, like, we did the whatever, be where your feet are, and people know kind of what that is and have a conversation around it. So, yep, absolutely. Great question. Other comments or questions? That's great. Well, thanks again. If you want to talk one-on-one, -on -one, I'll, be, I'll be here. Have a great day. Go off that survey.